It's no coincidence that the Bering Strait 2013 project started in Yakutia's capital, the same city that Semyon Dezhnyov's expedition set out from in the 17th century. Cossacks had launched three marine expeditions to the river Anadir from Yakutsk. Two attempts had failed. It was only on the third try in the summer of 1648 that Semyon Dezhnyov managed to pass through the strait between Chukotka and Alaska. 92 men went to sea, but only 12 survived. By a curious coincidence, an international team of cold water swimmers made two attempts to swim across the Bering Strait in 2011 and 2012. But the task was insurmountable. Those waters are the harshest in the world. The swimmers tried twice from Kamchatka, but they were frustrated and both attempts failed. Usual methods were simply not good enough. This extremely difficult task required a completely different approach. To swimmers, the Bering Strait is what Mount Everest summit was to mountain climbers, a most cherished dream. In the northernmost part of the Pacific, where it meets the Arctic Ocean, the water's ice cold and the polar air is freezing even in the summer. Deciding to go on a 100 kilometer swim without any heat insulation or indeed any equipment at all is rather unusual. Bering, да? But for those who gathered in Yakutsk on the 29th of July 2013, an opportunity to be part of this record-setting swim was something to be relished. Experienced swimmers from 16 countries and 10 Russian cities flock to Yakutsk. The Russian Geographic Society and the Eastern Military District of Russia had recruited these enthusiasts to attempt a decidedly risky and uncertain endeavor. 365 years after the Strait's discovery, these people were willing to attempt to bridge the gap between the two coasts. Serious preparations for the swim began only after the leaders of the Kasatka Ice Swimming Association of Khabarovsk region had approached Admiral Konstantin Sidenko, commander of the Eastern Military District, and by chance, president of the Cold Water Swimming Federation of Russia. It was then that the expedition to the Bering Strait started to take shape. Everything was clear. It would be the swimmer's job to swim their part of the distance, and the Air Force and the Navy would take care of the rest. All teams were given visa and customs support because the route crossed the border between Russia and the USA. A Russian naval ship was granted permission to stay in US waters. The members of many teams were no strangers to discipline and order. They had backgrounds in their country's military and even special forces. In South Africa, we are uh, very close to Antarctica and are swimming in Antarctica. And um, until one year ago, I never thought, never been to Russia, never thought I'd come to Russia. And just in the last year, I've been to Russia four times. And uh, looks like I'm, I need to move to Russia because that's where the real action in cold water swimming happens. I've 
I've seen a lot of people swimming in a, in a lake or in, in small places. But this is going to be in the open sea. Я много раз видел, как люди плавают в озерах реках, но это будет закрыто в открытом море. And, and requires a lot of uh, mental strength, not only the physical strength. Для этого нужно очень много не только физической, но и именно психической, моральной силы. Okay. Um, because of the challenge, I'm sure there will be quite a lot of drama, which is part of it. Я думаю, что этот закон будет очень драматичным, потому что это очень серьезный и очень сложный закон. Но я не сомневаюсь, что это будет. International teams included outstanding swimmers who had set records in various waters around the globe, from the coast of Patagonia and South Africa to the North Sea and the English Channel. One of the swimmers, James Pitter of Australia, was a visually impaired para-Olympian, and the support he received during the swim exemplified the Bering 2013 team's outstanding spirit. Swimmers from the Russian team spent two years preparing for the Bering Strait Relay. They had swum several swimathons in the cold waters of the Tata Strait and the Amur Bay. Teams from Khabarovsk and Blagoveshensk collectively accumulated over 1,000 kilometers on the Amur River. It should be noted that there are practically no age limits for mountain climbers and cold water swimmers. They are a very special breed, with extraordinary endurance and willpower. Comparing swimmers with climbers is legitimate. In cold waters and places like the Himalayas, humans are at deadly risk. Life depends on the ability to exercise one's will and be fearless in that zone between life and death. The commander's airplane flew participants from Moscow and Khabarovsk to Yakutsk and from there to Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsky. Before the race, there were meetings, press conferences, and warm hospitality in Yakutia's capital. The time spent in Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky was probably even more important. The swimmers used it to acclimatize, recover from jet lag, and to familiarize themselves with the new environment and the customs of the indigenous people. They also tested the waters of the Lena River and the Russian Pacific. Evening of 31st of July 2013, the expedition participants got together on board the Irtish, the Navy's hospital ship that was to serve as the swimathon's base, providing the swimmers and their support teams with everything they needed. The Navy's military hospital, complete with medical personnel, treatment and rehabilitation equipment, three extra boats specially added to accompany the swimmers, and an experienced crew, was fully prepared for a long expedition. As soon as the civilians were on board, the military way was made clear to them, so as to avoid any misunderstanding. Hello everyone, I'm the expedition commander. My name is Viktor Torbin. 
Interpreters, please communicate the gist later to those who don't speak Russian. I'm in charge during the expedition, and I don't care whether you're a general, a woman, or a boy. You must do what I say. Your life will depend on the captain's commands and mine. Whether we return will depend on how well we do things. Thank you for being here and for listening. I hope that we will all come back in good health in 10 to 15 days. The historical coincidences continued. The Irtysh's route from the port of Petropavlos Kamchatsky to Cape Dezhnyov has a rich history filled with the names of Russian explorers. The ship followed the same route as Commander Vitas Bering's first expedition in 1724, made according to Peter the Great's order to the north to discover whether America joins Asia. At that time, academics were yet to come across Semyon Dezhnyov's travel reports in the Yakuk archives, and world maps had blank spots in the north of the Pacific Ocean. Two Russian expeditions by Vitus Bering and Alexei Chirikov in the early 18th century completed the Age of Discovery. They had sailed and accurately measured the coordinates of the strait the coasts of Chukotka and Alaska, and many islands. The Russian explorers made the first, and to this day, the most accurate maps of the northern Pacific. James Cook's Royal British Expedition arrived in the Aleutian Islands 40 years later, in 1768. It was there that Captain Cook met Russian sailors. It's well known that Cook redrew his map and named the strait dividing Asia and America after Bering. So that was how the destination for the Bering 2013 expedition and intercontinental swimathon got on the map. It took the Irtysh five days to travel from Kamchatka to Cape Dezhnyov, so expedition members had time to get acquainted. The expedition numbered 122, not counting the Irtysh's crew and doctors. International teams brought their own coaches, journalists and doctors. A TV crew, sports doctors and the leaders of the Veterans Council of the Eastern Military District attended the Russian team. Well, finally got there. Yes, yes, finally the Bering Strait. We'll swim across, over there. There were also three people on board who had a special mission. The unusual thing about the journey was that none of the organizers, expedition managers, the Irtysh's officers and crew, international teams of swimmers and researchers, or journalists had ever crossed the Bering Strait. With the exception of one person who was going to the strait for the second time, it was a first for everybody. In fact, as later events showed, this person was indispensable. 
Let's introduce world record holder Yevgeny Novajev, who together with Konstantin Aksyonov crossed the Bering Strait on a kiteboard in July 2011. They covered the Chukotka-Alaska route in 7 hours and 52 minutes. With no support or rescue team, Yevgeny and Konstantin were the first people to cross the 170-kilometer wide strait without the aid of a boat. They did it during a storm by accurately assessing the wind situation and calculating to the minute the start and finish time. That was the kind of expert the team organizers had invited to help navigate and manage the expedition. This is Cape Peg. It's less windy here, or so it's believed. And that protrusion is the Great Chukotka Nose, later renamed Cape Dezhnyov. It's that way, over there. We shall have to get on the other side of it. But for now, we're sheltered from the north wind. On the morning of 5th of August 2013, the Irtish and a seagoing tug arrived at Cape Dezhnyov. The plan for the swimathon was that a group of swimmers would be taken to their starting points on two boats. Three swimmers and a starter navigate a judge on each. Each swimmer, after a relay touch in the water with the previous swimmer, would swim for 20 minutes. The starter navigator judge would use a GPS device to accurately record the start and finish points and the time for each swimmer. The data would be transmitted to the race HQ, where the coordinates for the stage would be put on a map. The average swim speed was assumed to be 3 km an hour, and the distance would be between 110 and 120 km, depending on the currents, and the total race time, 40 hours. The base ship would maneuver along the course of the swim, while the other ship, the seagoing tug, would indicate the direction and be prepared to render first aid. That was the plan, but upon arrival at Cape Dezhnyov, the race HQ decided that time in the water would be set for each individual swimmer, and only after reconnaissance covering the state of the weather, water temperature and speed of the currents. The date, time and location of the starting points would be set only after this survey. The escort boats were launched. The groups led by Viktor Torbin and Yevgeny Novajev approached the Cape to measure the currents and temperatures, while Ram Barkai's group of swimmers set out towards the starting point for a test swim to give the other participants an accurate idea of what to expect. What can we expect if we go to the top of the world? The following most eastern point of the Eurasian continent. We're trying to reach it for a long time now. Finally, yeah, get there hopefully. Make this swim happen. Let's go reach Disney. Let's make this swim. Reach Alaska. Simeon Disney. There? This is the monument to Semyon Dezhnev, and over there we have the old village of Naukan. And they have a Semyon Dezhnev monument too. Yeah. 
Tell me, will anyone swim today? <laughs> Sometimes the waves are big. Sometimes who'll swim now? Who'll train? Jack? Then there, there may be, there are sometimes big waves and a northerly wind. Big waves, sometimes. The test swim by South African swimmers Ram Barkai and Ryan Stramrud lasted five minutes. It turned out that the cold got to them the worst during the wait for the start signal. And then, after they got back on the boat and had to wait for over 40 minutes in wet clothes, buffeted by fierce winds at temperatures of 5 to 7 degrees Celsius. As a result, the time in the water was cut to 10 minutes. It was also decided to help the swimmers out of the water and onto the boat, since their hands would lose all sensitivity. Two swimmers, another 10 minutes to get back to the boat. So 20, yeah. So 20 minutes. The ship is the most fine. Sometimes to drink, it's fine. 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 Okay. Also, ram, ram. Not, not, also, we'll be two guys in three ribs, mm -hmm. for which in each rib will be two swimmers. Yeah, but you when will you finish done, swimming, you wait. Yes, you will done mm -hmm. your swim, two another will begin, we'll be on and you will be delivering to the boat. But if you're the first swimmer, you swim ten minutes, yes. and then you wait, you wait ten minutes. Yes. Okay. And after you swim, you will wait second one. We will try to
At 4 p.m., the Irtysh was at the starting point. The first team of swimmers and a team of judges headed to the shore. On the shore, Yevgeny Navajev recorded the coordinates and start time of the first intercontinental swimming race. Melissa O'Reilly, an athlete from the US, was unanimously granted the privilege of swimming the first stage of the Bering 2013 relay. One after another, the international team of swimmers immediately felt the power of the Strait's icy embrace as they covered the first kilometers. The temperature of the water kept going down, and just 45 minutes later, it was 3 or 4 degrees Celsius at the most. The bitter, salty and dense icy water meant that the 10 minutes in the water were a serious challenge for all the swimmers, and for some it was really shocking. Oh. 
Later, they all said the same thing. A minute felt like an eternity, as the chest muscles pressed on the lungs like a vice, making breathing almost impossible. Even for those who had swum among icebergs, the Bering Straits water turned out to be a tall order. During the first hours of the swim, the Bering Strait ceased to be a geographic name or just a piece of ocean. To all the swimmers, it became a personality, a rival, who had allowed them onto its territory and was now watching their audacious enterprise with a grin. The water was so cold that the swimmers swam at half their normal speed. The strongest only managed to cover up to 600 meters in 10 minutes. Dusk fell quickly. The wind grew stronger and the air temperature dropped to 5 degrees Celsius. The rules of the relay required that the swimmers touched each other. Having no interruptions in the line connecting Eurasia and America was essential for setting a world record. On top of that, it was strictly prohibited for swimmers to use the inflatable safety buoy, part of the swimmers' standard equipment, to rest in the water. Any breach of these rules could invalidate the entire race. So the result of the collective effort depended on each individual swimmer. At the same time, a swimmer could terminate their stage by holding up their hand, which was the signal for the next swimmer to get going. The Bering Strait completely disregarded the promise made by Arctic guidebooks of white nights. The nights were dark, visibility dropped, making it difficult to orient the swimmers. And as if the 12 meter per second wind and high waves weren't enough, it started raining. What's up with the ear tish? Did they sort it? You mean coming closer? I mean putting the ship on the course so the swimmers can see where to swim. They can't see even where you direct them with your hand. Slava, start moving over there. There. Where's the swimmer? Over there. Keep to the right. Come right at me. Slava, replacement. Replace him. Over here, come here. Replacement. The swimmers had to monitor their condition themselves, while the starter's responsibility was to watch the swimmer's behavior closely before and during the stage and be ready to rescue the swimmer without delay. After 10 minutes in such water, the temperature of a swimmer's body and brain is reduced to 32 degrees Celsius. Motor performance of arms and legs deteriorates, as does eyesight and spatial awareness. The current and the wind are dragging me off. Let's 
We're mooring. You go to the ship, I'll fill in for you. Where are your boys? You should have six. Look closer. Radio Yakov Levitz and tell him to replace you right now. All right, come closer and change. The three hours of the night swim seemed endless. Overcoats and blankets shared by the Irtish's sailors helped the swimmers stay warm before and after their stages. They had to hold on until after they got to the ship's rehabilitation area and the hot sauna. Then they got three hours of sleep and after a doctor's check, prepared to swim all over again. Do we have wet blankets? The route of the swim was drawn with the northern current in mind, so that the swimmers could benefit from it and move faster towards the southern tip of Ratmanov Island, aka Big Diomede. Hour after hour the swim went on. Dawn broke pale and pink. By the morning of the 6th of August, over 20 kilometers of the strait had been completed and Ratmanov Island had come into sight. В 1991 году, когда впервые осуществлялся этот проект переплыть Беринга в пролив. In 1991, when the first attempt to swim across the Bering Strait was made, a team of our swimmers, eight people, swam from Ratmanov Island to Cape Dejniov. They did it in 14 hours, but one has to say the weather favored them. This time it was quite something, both yesterday and today. But Lena Gusova, a member of that team, is participating in our swim and is moving toward the goal with much confidence. Температура воды колеблется от трех и двух десяток до трех и восьми десяток. Половцы плывут по десять минут. The water temperature ranges from 3.2 to 3.8 degrees. The swimmers do 10-minute stages, the most optimal time, and they do their best to cover the most distance. After all, the water is not 7 or 8 degrees, so it stiffens the muscles a lot, and the swimmer slows down, the whole race slows down. We could have fewer changes, but the swimmer would be slower, and the total time would stretch out. On a straight line, the distance from Cape Dejniov to Ratmanov Island is 36 kilometers, but the expedition covered more to go around the southern tip.
Irlanda. Hayana Nip, New Lamour. Thank you very much. Fantastic journey. Excellent adventure. Super expedition. Full understanding in all languages. How are you feeling? Good. Oh, you speak good Russian. Sure. Next, next swimmer. Vedle plavca. Nyet, nyet zadu. Vedle, blíže k němu. In the afternoon, they approached Redmanov Island. The water grew slightly warmer, and by the relay's third round, the swimmers had got used to the straight stinging water and the perils of climbing up and down the Irtish's gangway. The boats were continuously busy, taking swimmers back and forth. 36 kilometers of the distance were done. Matthias swam for a full 10 minutes, but he was really cold. They wiped him off, covered him with towels and a blanket, and he's sitting there, but the wind is piercing. He needs to dress quickly. Mothership, heading to the mothership. У нас последний вышел 10 минут. Все было здорово. Замечательно. Ребята, о! Она теплее. Да, реально теплее. Градусов 6. Everything was great. Wonderful. Valodia, was the water warmer? Yes, much warmer, about 6 degrees. We can live with that. What do we do about Jackie? She's lost her boy. It's all right. Let her swim. Don't we need to reattach it? No, too much hassle. Two boats are watching her. Let her swim. She'll be all right. Jackie is a marvel. She'll turn 70 soon. But there's no stopping her. 29 hours in the English Channel. Just imagine that. 29 hours of non-stop swimming between England and France.
In the meantime, the race was entering unknown territory. A new segment of the route had to be drawn, and they had to work out what the strait had in store, south of the Diomede Islands. Yevgeny Novazhev's team went on a reconnaissance mission. The kite has almost got dragged under the boat. Well, everyone rushed to the bow. <laughs> we shall need to sail at least another kilometer to get to the strait between the islands and see what's going on there. So this is the big diamede, and the one on the right is the small. The small one's American, the big one's ours. Yes, but the islands were discovered and named by Russians. This one is Ratmanov Island, and that one is Kruzenstern Island. Now let us do the measurements between the islands. They told us not to go beyond 169. 
Can we call them? We are on 169 now, but we need to know what the current is like further on. This is the Irtish. Victor, we're now facing Ratmanov Island's southern cape, but we need to sail another kilometer into the strait. The buckets on ropes are floating anchors, intended to compensate the load from the wind and measure the current speed. How much was it? 7.2? It's 6.4 now. Measuring the speed of the current between the islands and the water temperature along the tentative route didn't reveal any significant anomalies. However, a large group of walruses on Ratmanov Island's southern tip was a concern, since the true masters of the strait don't like humans and are aggressive at close quarters. The route of the swim was pulled back by several kilometers from that point, so as not to frighten or provoke the sea beasts. They are the guards, or defenders if you will, who rushed into battle. Oh yes, the others are lying down. These are the strong ones. The defenders. Are they always ready to swim across Bering Strait? Yes, in one go. The second night of the race fell. The night of 7th of August turned out to be a serious test for all the swimmers. It was pitch dark and raining heavily. There were gusts of up to 25 meters a second and waves over 4 meters. They say there's a storm coming. How strong? Over force nine, they reckon, depending on the wind situation, on the gusts. As we move on, it'll be even stronger. In such conditions, it was almost impossible to lead the swimmers in the water. They became disorientated. They would move inexplicably, swim in circles, and then strike out toward the light. The starter's signals were drowned in the roar of the waves. But above all, the strong wind and the tall, steep waves made it impossible to watch the swimmers. And there was a serious risk of injury or loss of life if a hull hit them. There's a swimmer right there on the course. Roman, replacement time. Swim to meet them. Tell me where to swim. Over there. To the boat? Yes. All right, I'm jumping in. Jump. Roman, your boat is that one. Roman, yours is behind you. Guys, I'm here. Одежда. 
After two hours of fighting with the strait between the islands in the pitch darkness, an order was issued to interrupt the race and put the boats on board the Irtysh. Cover your back, legs and relax for a couple of minutes, then you can dress. Such an eventuality had been anticipated in the rules of the open water relay race. Sasha, are you cold? No, I'm fine. The coordinates of the point of interruption were recorded. By midnight of the 7th of August, the swimmers had covered 59 kilometers of the route. The abrupt night stop was incomprehensible and frightening for people. It required understanding and some risky decisions. A sunny morning on the 7th of August made it possible to get a view of Ratmanov Island and its inhabitants. But doubts and uncertainty hung over the swim team. Conflicting opinions regarding continuing and the team's unreadiness raged. But a decision had to be made, and it was made. That night was the first respite for the swimmers, who slept through until 7 in the morning. At 8.30, after breakfast, everybody gathered in the Irtish's gym, the largest room on the ship. There was a birthday celebration, among other things. Impressions were shared, and everyone anxiously awaited the race management's decision. The international recognition, your presence, your views of our country, our unity, all these things make me feel very happy and I feel young again. I'm so happy. I love you and shall never forget you. First off, I want to say that our dear James Pitter, a member of our team, made his swim yesterday. But the weather was, was really tough, so we had to stop it for safety reasons. First of all, we have to go and we have to look for all your lives. 
Today, in spite of the unfavorable weather, we'll resume our challenge and continue the race at 10 a.m. Nobody has ever achieved that by swimming. Let's do it today. Those who have never been to America, raise your hands. Welcome to America. At 10.30 a.m., the boats with swimmers on board headed to the starting point. There was a sharp cold wind between the islands and it was fog-bound. What's more, there was snow on Ratmanov Island. Summer can be like that in the Bering Strait. Вчера здесь и был остановлен заплыв. Шестого числа, да, это примерно было где-то в 23:30. On the 6th, the race was interrupted at this location at about 11.30 p.m. because of heavy rain and very large waves. I would say force 3 or 4 and an extremely strong wind. Our boat caught a lot of wind and nearly went over the swimmer. Today is the 7th of August. At 11, we reached the point where we stopped yesterday. So we continued our expedition to America. Our swimmers from Tuman swam the first stage to cross the border between Russia and the United States of America. Seriously, did the water feel good? It was great. I had no fear this time. It was sunny. I really enjoyed it. I looked down into the depths. The water was amazingly clear. There were jellyfish and all kinds of creatures. I can't tell you how great it felt. I didn't feel cold anymore. My body had adapted. May I go to the steam room? Could you have swum another 10 minutes? I'm not sure how many more minutes, but I could have swum longer. And for the first time, previously, especially the first time, 10 minutes felt so long, endless. But this time I didn't notice how time had flown. When you called me, I thought you wanted to correct the course. Yeah. <laughs> 
Er Tisch had entered American territorial waters, so the base ship ran up the Stars and Stripes. Cold water swimming is one of the most extreme sports, if it can be called a sport. Mountain climbing, extreme jumping, ice water swimming and deep diving are not regular contests. Athletes don't compete in terms of scores, times, distance covered, etc. In these sports, you compete with the natural forces of the open ocean, streams of air, vertical cliffs and glaciers, and competitive people tend to choose the most difficult route one that no one's attempted before. Often, the objective is generally considered to be impossible. The beyond extreme efforts involved open depths of insight and experience inaccessible in regular life. It has to be said that extreme forces shape this special breed of people. Swimmers Jack Bright from the UK and Craig Lenning from the US supported and accompanied James Pitter, who came out for his next stage. Bring him, bring the swimmer. James, молодец, не зрячий. То есть он вечной темноте, но при этом вот они сейчас плывут в паре с Крейком. Крейк его напарник. James is completely blind, but he is swimming paired with Craig, who sets the pace for him, and that pace is pretty good. Cam, очень хороший держит. The character of such competitors awes me. I watched him at night, I was his starter, and over five minutes he deviated from the course only twice and only very slightly. It's really beyond my understanding. Right. 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 
Dense white heaps of clouds were hanging over the Diomede Islands, and the north wind was pushing them towards the expedition. The Bering Strait turned out to have lots of ways to confuse even these determined people. By 2 p.m. a thick fog had covered everything. Visibility fell to 60 to 100 meters, and the boats were cut off from the base ship. For more than an hour, the escort boats couldn't get back to the base ship because their navigators couldn't see it in the fog. The swimmers continued with their stages while the expedition commander tried to figure out how to help his crew. I get it, I get it. We rely on you here. We agreed that the first one to see the ship would get chocolate. As the chief starter, I simply can't renege on that deal. It was Andre Kuzmin who was the first to see what looked like the Flying Dutchman. So I'm ceremoniously handing him his prize to the roar of applause. Hooray! Installing antennas on the boats eventually solved the problem. That made it possible to monitor the boat's positions from the Irtish's bridge, and the race continued deep into the night. It was fresh inspiration considering that two-thirds of the route was behind us. The main thing was to cross that mysterious line, which proved to be so hard. It was the line between the Western and Eastern Hemispheres, Russia and America, and between today and yesterday. We were crossing a time zone, which was rather hard. Going into the future, we're in step with time, but going to the past seemed like a difficult challenge. The race route was passing north of Fairway Rock, a small, uninhabited island that stood in solitude behind the participants' backs for the rest of the race, like a silent guard of the Bering Strait.
Day three of the race, most swimmers had each covered four to five stages. Fatigue was building up and not everyone was able to recover quickly enough. However, the proximity of the finish line and a water temperature of 10 degrees Celsius gave grounds for optimism. But the formidable Bering Strait still had something in store for the race. Mountain climbers never say we conquered the summit, rather they say the mountain allowed us to reach the summit and most importantly it let us leave. This is exactly the way the strait behaved. It allowed the swimmers through its icy waters, through darkness, storm and fog and to overcome fears of encounters with walruses. It gave them time to think and perhaps pull out of this audacious plan and now it was preparing its final surprise. It was just 20 kilometers to the finishing line. No obstacles were in sight, and as is usually the case in such situations, victory was being anticipated. Today is the 8th of August. The international team is getting close to Alaska's shores. We checked the map and our navigation instruments. About 18 kilometers to go. But our own experience told us that the last kilometers were always the hardest. And sure enough, the Bering Strait showed us its full might. We'd been at its mercy for two days and been shown all kinds of weather. The forecasts that the weather might change every two hours were vindicated. Well, let's hope we reach Alaska today, after all, and put up the Russian flag and American flag. And then, with a sense of a job well done, we'll head home. On the morning of 8th of August, race speeds dropped dramatically as the swimmers hit the wall of a head current that pushed them back. The situation was particularly acute. 8th of August was the last day the base ship was permitted to stay in US waters. So if the finish line wasn't crossed before the time expired, it might never be crossed. Sasha, keep me updated on your three, on each of them, the distance in meters, all right? Ten minutes is not a lot. It's fine, they can swim on, but Alaska is not in sight for some reason. <coughs> Sasha, how is it going? I got the coordinates and we'll check progress in five minutes. Let's do that. If there's no progress, we'll interrupt the race reconnoiter the current and then resume. Got it? Copy that.
17 kilometers, 378 meters. Are we moving at all? The strongest swimmers were doing their best, but couldn't move forward a single inch. What could the others do? How many minutes? Three and a half till the change. It'll now be eight, and Edik moved 150 meters to the south. Put the point on the map, take the swimmers out of the water, and then you go and survey the current. Yes, I was swimming as fast as I could, and it seemed like I was pacing the boat. I thought I was moving fast, but in reality I was just swaying about and couldn't break through. The trajectory is crooked. Let's move farther away and see. At about six o'clock, I had to interrupt the race because the last three shifts had only covered 50 meters in an hour and a half. I sent out a team to survey the southern current to determine its width, speed and direction. To break through the current, we need a speed of three to four kilometers an hour. So we decided to choose the strongest swimmers who used only crawl. We selected 30 swimmers. We were 19 kilometers from America and had to complete our mission very fast. Is it? 
Четко курс на юго-восток сначала и прорываться. Придется лишних километров дать. We'll head southeast and try to get through. We'll have to cover many extra kilometers and just struggle and struggle some more. Four kilometers an hour. We need the most determined ones, and we shall have to fight for at least ten hours. That's the only way. We're dealing with a river. At least the water's warm. It's 13.5 degrees, feels like Miami. We're at the coordinates from where we can continue our relay race. Victor, Alexei is pushing on the right now. They won't let him, but he's pushing. I'm not against him. Let him swim first or second, but make sure someone is there to replace him. He'll work for 10 minutes and we'll move back by 20 meters. Look, Victor, we're not shaving until the expedition ends. No shaving, no trimming nails, no brushing our teeth. Alex is really anxious to get in the water. Go! Look, look how he's pushing. He's really motivated. Rafael, well done. So, Alex didn't make it. Dimitri will replace him. How's it going? Eighty meters are yours, twenty are Alex's, for a total of one hundred meters. Да. 
Everything okay? 180 meters. The six-hour battle against the strait had gained the race a mere two kilometers. By evening, it was clear that a new plan would have to be hatched. In the meantime, a storm broke out in the eastern part of the strait. Wind and side waves rocked the Irtish. The boats had to be lifted on board quickly. It was still possible on the lee side, although there was a risk of damaging the boats if they hit the ship. Once the boats were on board, the Irtish headed to the Diomed Islands into Russian waters. Special credit is due to the Irtish's sailors and rescue divers who manned the escort boats. There were only four of them and each worked up to 12 hours on the water. The swimmers changed but the sailors were on duty all the time. On the Irtish, pulling the exhausted swimmers up the gangway and on the escort boats, their performance was remarkable and unforgettable. On the morning of the 9th of August, the expedition was near the Russia-US border. It seemed that only Ratmanov Island's inhabitants, the walruses playing in the stormy waters waving their flippers, were glad to see them. They seemed to be laughing through their thick whiskers at the expedition. So we were back on the American border. The Irtish's permit to visit U.S. waters had run out, and we had to go back on the other side of the border, between the small and the big Diomedes. We were 17 kilometers short of reaching Alaska. The swimmers had not made it because of the powerful currents. It was so strong that the swimmers simply stayed in the same place in spite of all their efforts. The current was like a huge river. Even our boats could only move forward at pedestrian speed. So we spent more than a day there and had to go back. And if we could get permission to re-enter US waters, we would return to the point where the swim was interrupted and try to continue the race. By noon, the Irtish's captain was granted permission to re-enter U.S. waters. The news that the fight would continue spread like wildfire around the ship. The race participants, fresh after their first full night's sleep, assembled in a large group. Each brought the best they had to the team to bolster the shared determination to win. There were no rivals. It was truly a united world team, hardened and determined. No one was contemplating giving up. 
It was at that moment that the Bering Strait had a change of heart. Let's explain. On the night of the 10th of August, the Irtysh backtracked along the race route, anchored and hid from the stormy waves and wind in the shadow of the Alaskan Cape. It was here the sailors and expedition commanders, observing the ship's drift on the 200-meter chain, got a tip-off from the strait itself. It turned out that the speed of the current changed with the tides. Between 2 and 6 in the morning, the current slowed down, so the river in the ocean could be dealt with. What a lucky, accidental discovery! An immediate decision was made to continue the race without waiting for the storm to subside. A team of the fastest swimmers went to the starting point. The strongest were determined to take the straight on. Twenty-seven swimmers from the UK, America, South Africa, Estonia, Ireland, Italy, Russia, the Czech Republic, Chile and Poland took turns and clawed their way meter by meter along the distance separating the team from the Alaskan shore and victory. On that day, they got four kilometers closer. At 2 a.m. in the morning on the 11th of August, the same high-speed group of swimmers continued the battle. After six hours, they had fought their way through the current's remaining three and a half kilometers. Each member of the storm team swam more than 10 times.
So, Chigorin, Guseva. Guseva was replaced by Chigorin. Lena Guseva and Sergei Popov. Come in, Irtish. Once again, how much? 150 meters. Roger that. Самая главная проблема заключалась в том, что мы воткнулись в течение. Мало того, мы ожидали течение с юга на север, а оно было с востока на запад. Мы практически уперлись в стену, которая нас просто швыряла, отшвыривала. The biggest problem was that we got stuck in the current. Moreover, we expected the flow from south to north, but it turned out to be east to west. We ran into a wall that threw us back towards Chukotka. We tried as best we could to assess the speed and direction of the flow at various points along the route in the direction of Alaska. We identified an area of about three to four kilometers, which had to be overcome by any means. We picked the strongest and fastest swimmers for the task, but on average they managed no more than 150 to 180 meters in 15 minutes. They battled against the current and after six hours finally broke through the wall. And so we reached a place where there was a weaker current going from south to north. Once again, Ryan, eh? Yes, 620 meters, course 85. Copy that. Good. 15 minutes. Good enough? It means we're fast approaching the coast of Alaska, despite the wind being 10 to 12 meters per second and waves of around 3 meters. It rains off and on, and there's fog, but Alaska is getting closer. I hope we can finish today, but it's impossible to predict things here. We've had lots of surprises already. This is the Bering Strait. We've been treading water, so to speak, for three days now. By 9 in the morning on the 11th of August, the swimmers had reached calm waters near Cape Prince of Wales. The storm team was replaced with swimmers who had been waiting for their turn to contribute to the cause. A little after 4 p.m., the race reached the finishing line. There is nothing much more to comment on, except to say that this remarkable story was full of odd coincidences. The race started at 4.32 and the finishing line was crossed at the exact same time. 432. Дорогу, дорогу, дорогу.
Left hand? Left hand, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, is careful. It, is it your head, Jack? Watch your head. Step here. Okay. 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 One, two, step. Step down. Step down. Step down. Step down. This is like swimming in each other. Точка номер 69. До берега осталось километр 200. Okay. <laughs> Молодец. Давно рвалась к этому месту, коляски. И вот моя мечта осуществилась. Я очень счастлив и благодарю тех, кто организовал этот заплыв, а также судьбу, что она мне преподнесла такой подарок, который я бы не получил нигде в мире. Давай, давай! Hello, hello, Siberia. What, what country are you from? Russia, 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 Russia. Russia. Thank <laughs> you. 